getting ready for bed. And, you know, this is, we're up a little later than normal, and I'm like, well, I'm just rabbit trailing. Uh, so if you've been with us at all, you know that sometimes, even as I have a message and I have it scripted out, some new kind of thought or whatnot kicks into my head and I, I begin to, you know, go down the rabbit trail. So I don't even know that my notes are going to be worth anything because we may just go down a whole new thing. But we will uh, press into scripture, we will sing songs, we will be together, and hopefully our time will be, be edified as we do those things. Uh, tithes and offering, I want to make sure that people know you can drop off a check in the back. You can... Um, give online, which Justin reminds me is, you know, his preferred simplest method, but uh, some people still have these paper things, and you would write the amount on a piece of paper and sign your name to it, and then that tells, like, the banking authorities to transfer money. It's, it's a really fascinating thing if you study history. Um, they were called checks, um, but it's, yeah, it's a deep historical um, item there. Uh, but no, it, it is good the church continues, and it's a challenge in COVID, and we're still trying, and, and how do we serve this community? How do we serve each other? And so your tithes and offerings and that commitment to that is um, very much appreciated as we continue to do ministry as a church here in West Portland. Uh, it is also Black History Month, uh, and I want to make sure that we are mindful of that um, and, and honoring uh, the contributions of uh, people of color in the nation. There's certainly uh, wrongs that have been done and uh, things that we need to kind of recover from, but I want to make sure that we're just mindful and we're, we're celebrating a little bit um, and honoring uh, the journeys of others. And so uh, one of the things, I share this in the midweek message, and sometimes we forget, we've been talking a little bit about lenses, we view through as well that every single one of your heroes of faith that you would find in scripture, right? And and we often kind of have our favorite story. I always really loved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, it was also my mom would say, to, and to bed we go. It was like that was like the ending, right? Shadrach and Bab was what we would call them in like youth ministry to sound cool when we probably weren't. But all right, so so those were kind of my favorite. But we all have some heroes of faith, some Bible story that, that we just love um, and endure. But here's the reality. There's not a single character in Scripture, our sacred text, that is of white people. They were all people of color. Middle Eastern, North Africa, and our sacred text, every hero of faith, is a person of color. Um, and sometimes we forget that in a, in a westernized European culture, and, and we, we end up with lenses that translate it to, to just be more understandable, because what do we see normally? And so that's how our brain begins to translate. And so just a reminder that all of our heroes of old in Scripture were people of color. Um, and as we go into a month trying to honor and recognize that, I think is important uh, there is an article, I shared this in the midweek email, and it's uh, also on Facebook, uh, but there's an article that I read this last week. It's a little bit long. It's written by a black female who ended up houseless. We've also been doing uh, just the, the relevance of having a houseless couple living alongside our property. This last week we had four people from the church um, serving down at Night Strike as well, and, and many of you have been um, donating clothes and resources for the houseless community. So I think kind of a combination of just what's going on with the houseless community and engagement, as well as um, Black History Month, to, to read this article written by a, a very successful professional who ended up houseless and emerging from it. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to read the article and then if you are interested in the midweek email, there was also a Zoom link. I will be in a Zoom chat room uh, at 6 o'clock tonight, and I would love to just discuss the article. Um, and then even asking the question, where do we see Jesus in the midst of stories like these? Uh, so it's on the Facebook, it's on email. If you 
you still are interested and haven't figured out where that is, you can grab me after service and we'll figure out how to make sure that you can um, get into both the link, the article to read it, as well as the link to join the roundtable discussion if you are interested. Uh, other announcements. On the back table, I know several of you recently did the little blue update cards, um, which was for our records, but people have asked for a current kind of working directory, so we have good phone numbers or emails to reach out to people. So on the back, there is a uh, sheet of paper. It just says contact info for new directory. If you would fill this out and this just set it by the uh, offering plate, we'll get it into the office and to Justin. If you've already given all the information you want in the directory, that's fine on the card, but the children, you know, extra phone numbers, any of that. It will not be a, a photo directory this time, um, but um, a good, current, updated directory for people to be able to get hold of each other. And I think those are all my announcements. So if you guys would stand with me for the reading of scripture and our call to worship. Scripture reading this week comes from Jeremiah 18, 1 through 8. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there was a working, there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was working at play was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel that seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. Our call to worship is based off this text as well as Romans 12, 2 and John 17, 14 through 19. God, we are reminded of your grace filled and creative hands on us and how your hands work through our hands in our world. You are the Father, we are the God's hands on this universe, God hands on us, molding, creating. God's hands on the universe, God's hands on us, sheltering, healing, holding, blessing. Our hands molding, creating, playing, and still. Our hands keyboarding, drawing, writing, painting, and still. Our hands praying, blessing, healing, receiving, and still. God's hands on the universe, working with our hands day to day, on a day to day basis in our world, and always. As we get ready to sing this next song, there is a, a line here in the chorus that uh, ties in with our call to worship, too. And, uh, oh, to be like me, for being molded by God, for being redeemed by God, our desire ought to be like me, O oh God. It says, come in your sweetness, come in your fullness, stamp your own image deep on my heart. That the image of God would just be pressed into us and into our likeness, or our likeness into His. Um, and so as we sing this song, I want you to be thinking about that. Think about this verse and how it ties to the scripture, how it ties to our call to worship.
glasses so I can actually see you all. Um, so we are uh, coming to kind of completion of our series on redemption. Uh, and, and I want to start just kind of a little bit of a recap and remind that the, the definition of redemption, it, it kind of already assumes salvation. Right? It, it, the, the assumption that you've already been um, saved or purchased, but now, now that you're, you know, you're coming into right standing with God, it's what are you redeemed to? Right? It's kind of the, the now what? I've been saved. Now what? Like, we just check it off the box and we go about our ways because, you know, we, we accomplished that task. And, and, and that the process of redeeming is, is that purchasing of something, uh, but it often carries with it the connotation of, of repurposing it, right? So we've been looking at different stories. Uh, we started with the story of Ruth, the redemption story of Ruth, who's a foreigner, an outsider, um, and Boaz um, was the one who really was the, the kinsman redeemer uh, in terms of terminology and, and, and theology in, in Old Testament. And it was really her redemption wasn't so much about necessarily having all of the knowledge and understanding or knowing all of the religious practices, but it was this, this commitment to the relationship of her mother-in-law after her husband passed away and they were traveling. This, and, and she says the words like, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. It was a relationally driven redemption. As she chose to identify, she chose to, to come and be a part of the kingdom of Israel and a part of the family and to be redeemed in. And, and her lineage is also the lineage of Jesus Christ. Right? So an outsider and a foreigner redeemed and brought into the kingdom of God. We then uh, looked at the uh, Ethiopian eunuch um, who, again, a foreigner, an outsider, um, somebody who would be considered marginalized because of physical attributes that go along with being a, a eunuch, according to, to the law, according to Old Testament scripture, that precluded him from being able to be a part of the kingdom of Israel and a part of being able to worship. And even as a foreigner, having traveled to Jerusalem, he couldn't go into the inner sanctuary, right? He had to stay in the outer parts. Uh, but but asking the question as he was reading scripture and Philip came alongside him, what prevents me from going down and being baptized? What is keeping me or who is keeping me from um, surrendering my life to God and making this decision to choose to follow? Uh, because he was talking with Philip, a lot of times uh, people actually will say Philip has become the patron saint of the marginalized. So the community groups on the edge looked to Philip um, as their patron saint, as, as he was part of this, this journey and this process, this process with the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and then last week, we, we read the story of Rahab uh, being redeemed and, and part of the story. And Rahab, even though she was a prostitute, her lineage is included in the bloodline of Christ and being incorporated in. And uh, I, the best way to kind of describe Rahab would be probably morally questionable um, based on her profession and based on turning on her own city because she saw that the work of God was, was there and there was power and something happened. And so these are, are the, the redemption stories we have looked at. Um, and today as we kind of come to the, this end, it, the idea of like, well, what does it mean for us to be redeemed? Uh, and, and so this passage of Jeremiah, where the image of the, the prophet Jeremiah going down to the potter's house and watching this craftsman begin to form whatever he was forming, you know, a vase or whatever. And, and the text we read this morning says it was spoiled. The other text, and depending on the translation, it was marred, it was flawed, it was, I mean, you kind of get the idea. It wasn't 
turning out the way uh, he intended or, or is something useful. Now, I do have a question. Anybody work pottery before? Like, I mean, I, I think I did it like once or twice at a camp, because like, but I, I never like regularly did it. And I definitely, in that process, you get the spinning wheel and, you know, wet and everywhere, and it's a mess, and you're trying to shape something. Anybody in here do pottery and is more of an expert than me? We got, uh, Taylor got for Christmas a little, like a play version, but it actually has the spinning thing and she set it up on our dining room. So it's, you know, our dining room is always craft central and a mess and um, beautiful chaos uh, <laughs> is how I <laughs> usually describe it. Because uh, clay sticks everywhere. Uh, but so the clay, as it, as it you know, you, you end up messing it up a lot of time now, well, let me just try to fix it. Right? It, it's been messed up, it's out of shape, it's one, let me try to fix it. And, and, and what I've noticed, and, and through you and kind of just reading a little bit, trying to watch some YouTube and people like just for relevance say, uh, once it starts to go, the more you try to fix it, typically the worse it gets. And so, so the craftsman has to like start over. Right? If it's a bowl, it's a bowl no more, it's back to a lump. Um, and so then the question was, well, how do you keep, like, the clay actually moldable? And the only way to keep clay moldable is with water. You have to keep it wet. Um, if you don't keep it wet, you, you're not going to be able to shape it. You can clump it all back and it just begins to get harder and harder. Um, I would even use the phrase, more set in its way. Uh, now, I don't know about you guys, um, but I, from time to time, get a little set in my way. I dig my heels in on some issues, um, socially, politically, opinionated, sports, whatever. Uh, I mean, overall, I'm a pretty good arguer, too, so, like, give me a point of view, and I don't even need to really agree with it. I can argue. That's, I love in debate when they just, like, we need someone to argue this point, and everyone in the class, like, agrees on the other side. Like, well, I'll take it. I don't agree with it, but I can, I can argue, right? <laughs> so, so just, I mean, I'm the only one, though, right? You guys have never gotten set in your ways, dug your heels in. All right, well, this, this message is just for me then. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so the only way you keep the clay moldable is to keep it wet. And one of the interesting things in this, this section of, of Jeremiah and its prophecies even is this is where we really see the phrase living water start to, to come into Scripture a lot. The prophecies of living water. And there's New Testament references to it and even... You know, prophecy of the new heaven and the new earth and, and the new Jerusalem coming down and waters going out to the east and the west to supply everywhere and that being living water and this, this new heaven and new earth, this completion of all of God's promises includes this living water that comes back to even this clay. If you don't keep the clay wet, it becomes rigid, dried out, and unmoldable. And this is the image we're going with for redemption. We want to be moldable clay, in case you're not catching on, but that's what you want. Uh, then we need to stay connected to that living water. Uh, I want to give just a, a little bit before I go dive too much into that more, a little recap of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is an Old Testament prophet. Uh, and one of the interesting things, too, I always thought, like, some of the prophets, in, if you read the Old Testament, some of the books are bigger. And uh, in theology and in Bible school, they would refer to those as the major prophets. And then there's some of the prophets are smaller, and I would refer to them as the minor prophets. And, and in my mind, I'm like, oh, so the major ones are more important than the minor ones. Um, and really, the only distinguishing factor is they just use more words. It's the only thing that makes them major. They're longer books. Uh, in the New Testament, you find a couple, uh, type like, you know, uh, First and Second Thessalonians. Those were actually two different letters that were written, right? 
first letter to the Thessalonians, and then later another letter was written to Thessalonians. In the Old Testament, you know, like we have First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, all that meant was there was so much text, and scrolls at that time were only so long, and so they had to get a second scroll. So it's not quite, and it's just, and it, so sorry, that's completely random Bible knowledge. But uh, so Jeremiah. Uh, is considered one of the major prophets, but it's only because he used more words. Uh, he comes from a family of priests also, which is interesting because there's no record in Scripture of him really performing any priestly duties. There's no reference of him working at the temple, uh, any of that. The people of Israel at the time, if you read the whole text, uh, Jeremiah wasn't exactly uh, popular. He typically wasn't uh, prophesying or telling the people of Israel things they wanted to hear or things that made them feel good, right? He wasn't the, uh, the cheerleading prophet. He was kind of more the doom and gloom prophet, always talking about the impending judgment of God because Israel was struggling at that time. There's these outside forces and, and this fear that Egypt was going to come in and overtake them and overpower them. Uh, and, and even Assyria and, and all of that. And eventually they were, during Jeremiah's lifetime, uh, the Babylonians came in and conquered Israel and took a lot of Israelites back um, to Babylon. This was the, what we would call the, in the time of the exile. Uh, and then it goes into Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being in exile and all of that. Uh, several others within Israel, they, they actually escaped to Egypt. Um, so they weren't taken in exile, but they, they fled the land, um, and Jeremiah was actually one of those. But he was the one constantly telling, like, hey, like, as a nation, we are not pleasing God. As a nation, we are uh, becoming a little bit more set in our ways, more rigid. Uh, and, and if we turn, you know, God, God can do some things with us still. But if we just keep being determined to do our own thing, we're going to be in trouble. And nobody wanted to listen to Jeremiah. Uh, it says that he started prophesying at the age of 21, which is also unique to Israelite culture because typically um, you didn't do anything until you were 30. Right? Uh, you, were, you were an assistant. You were an apprentice. You were any of those. You didn't, uh, most rabbis didn't actually start teaching on their own until they were 30. Jesus didn't start his earthly ministry until he was 30. Right? This is, so, the, so for Jeremiah in this time, right? one, he was younger. He began prophesying earlier than, than tradition. There's no record of him really working in the, the temple as a priest, even though that was his family lineage, and therefore he would be included in that. Uh, and he's just running around telling everybody these doom and gloom stories. Like, who would listen to that guy? Uh, well, Israel did not, <laughs> uh, and repeatedly uh, kind of struggled and, and even confrontational uh, because the people of Israel were just so tired of Jeremiah talking about the impending doom. Uh, Jeremiah is also referred to as the weeping prophet because he was so passionate about his desire to see Israel saved. And continue to see Israel make even you know, the mistakes he did that that most of the time in his writing as he gets into to the passionate side of it he begins to lament and we even have the book of Lamentations which was also written by Jeremiah right and he's just weeping even there's one passage in in Lamentations where basically it illustrates he's, he's on his way he's leaving the city of Jerusalem after it's conquered and he looks over his shoulder and he sees his city in, in ruins. And how many years did he warn them? How many years did he plead with the people like, turn from your wicked ways, right? Turn and, and lean into God. And just repeatedly and, and just ignored. And so now he is leaving the city, looking over his shoulder at his home and destroyed. And just with a broken heart. Um, so Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, 
is the one who authored this text that we looked at this morning. This image of, of this potter mushing this thing back to create something else. So if we need to stay moldable, how, how do we do that? I and mean, I have some opinions, but this is actually, I would, you, can, you can actually talk and shout out if you want. Um, and I can repeat so everyone hears, but how do we, uh, like today, I mean, that's Old Testament and whatnot, but it's 2022. How do we, what, what practices can we do to stay moldable to, to whatever God would like to shape in us? How do we do that now? Was that? Through prayer. I always like praying because I think it, it ties our heart more to God's heart. It's an opportunity to shift what we're being connected to. Become more receptive. Become more receptible. Yeah. We use that at my day job because people matter. We use the phrase, we're going to be open and curious and committed to learning as opposed to being closed, defensive, and committed to being right. So are, are we staying open? What's that? Service. Service. Yeah. I think a lot of times we talk about this word discipleship, where we like study the Bible and we learn things. Um, but if you want to learn about humility, go and serve in a capacity where someone isn't necessarily grateful for your service. You will learn more about humility by doing than you will by reading. You will learn more about generosity and graciousness by doing than you will by reading. Right? So it's so a serving. Even if, I'm going to challenge us here, even if you end up stepping into a service that isn't necessarily comfortable, and probably even more so, right? Sometimes you're like, oh, well, I'm comfortable doing this. This is safe. I understand it. I'm going to, well, I'm going to serve here because I know everybody there also thinks like me. So my, my perceptive is a good, you know, challenge. And we step into a, a service role that maybe is a little uncomfortable stretches us a little bit. We have to work with people whose opinions are clearly wrong because mine are right. Uh, right? We're going to be a little bit more humble. It's going to challenge us a little bit more. We're going to have to think about maybe some of our beliefs and our opinions as we wrestle and listen. Uh, yeah, service is huge. What are, what are other ways we can stay moldable? You have to be willing to let go. Yeah, willingness. Right? I mean, it starts there. Like, am I Willing. We, we use the word in uh, surrender a lot in Christianity. Are we willing to surrender, to yield? Any others that people have? These are all really good. There are two, uh, as we looked at this, as I was thinking about this idea, you know, the clay has to stay wet and this tie into living water. Um, I was really thinking, how, how do we stay hydrated. Right? And scripture where it's to talk about that there's two kind of images that, that come into my mind or thoughts. One is we have to be mindful of what we are consuming. Right? Are we consuming living water? So are we praying? Are we serving? Are we, are we are we going back to the sacred text and actually reading it and allowing it to read us? Are we uh, from time to time even just in our, our meditations and reflections Looking at prayers, hymns, poetry that is um, filling us with, with water. Are we consuming? Are we staying hydrated uh, with things of God? Scripture, songs, new music, old music. Uh, I think even in that, in, in what we consume is conversations. Like, are we... And yes, I, I believe there's, like, step out of your comfort zone and, and, you know, have conversations with people who don't necessarily think like you. Uh, I think it's one of the best things that happened to me in my spiritual formations is very early on I went to work for an organization called Youth for Christ. And, and it's a parachurch organization, and it draws people from all sorts of denominations and faith groups. And, you know, all of my schooling in early years was, was in the Assemblies of God, and within a denomination, typically everybody kind of thinks alike. 
We have the same principles or this. And so, so I'm rooted in this. All my Bible schooling is going in there. I have a mentor pastor who's coaching me through all of this. And then I go to a, a YFC conference. Uh, and, and, and there's Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, uh, Pentecostals, non-denomination. And, and you just walk in and you sometimes you even assume, like, well, everybody, I, I assume because I'm going to a churchy thing or a religious thing, or maybe even church on Sunday, I assume everybody thinks like me. We all kind of have the base theological foundation. And uh, I met two guys there who uh, we did not agree on a lot, but we love to argue. Uh, and so it became, we had two conferences every year, and the three of us would stay up pretty much till breakfast sometimes, just debating theology, and we didn't agree. Uh, you know, Calvinist versus Arminian, you know, Wesleyan theology versus, you know, that was, it was wonderful in a lot of ways. Because the other thing that happened is when you have an opinion and everyone kind of thinks like you, you don't actually have to have a well-rounded argument. You don't really have to have even a solid understanding of what you're arguing because everybody agrees with you. And so you just maybe throw out a line that, you know, maybe a, a churchy line or a, a phrase we would use, and everyone, oh, yeah, good word, brother. Woo! <laughs> uh, you know, and we just say things like, well, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Oh, yeah! You know, because like, you don't actually have to defend your statement because everybody always agrees with it. You step into a, a realm where maybe not everybody agrees with it, and you throw out a line, and they go, huh? Yeah, and I just used it last night with my other group, and they liked it. What do you mean, huh? <laughs> when, and, well, where do you find that in Scripture? Like, how do you see that playing in? And I'm like, whoa. All of a sudden, you have to really begin to think and engage with what you believe. So, so I love I love that. Um, we, I, I do experiential education as well. And so we, we do, you know, make groups do various challenges where they're blindfolded, different things. And, and we debrief those, and we walk through a series of questions of, like, what did you just do? Um, so what did you learn? And then now what do you apply? Uh, you guys just got the 10-second debriefing facilitation training. But uh, in that realm, we, we use uh, the idea of, well, challenge by choice, but, but we use the, the comfort zone. That if you're, you're in the comfort zone, your ability to learn is actually pretty limited because you're comfortable. And so we actually intentionally push people out of their comfort zone and into an uncomfortable zone, or like, I like to make people uncomfortable, it's a, it's a gift. Um, uh, but we also call it the growing zone because people can, it's more palatable. Uh, marketing is everything. So, so it's not the uncomfortable zone, it's the growing zone. Uh, and, but then there's also, you can push people out of the uncomfortable zone into what we call the panic zone. And if you're in the comfort zone, you're not really growing. If you're in the panic zone, you're not growing or learning either. You're just full-on survival mode. You were shut down. Um, and, and you guys know, like, I'm going to stereotype, so I apologize for this. But so you, you see, like, really doping people. Like, oh, is that too hard for you? Let me come and help you and do that for you. Is that person going to grow at all? Right? They're not, because someone's, oh, is it too hard? Is it too uncomfortable? They're always trying to make it. So with some of my team, I really have to train them. Like, no, we want them uncomfortable. Uh, we have a new crop of interns that are starting on Tuesday, and, and one of the first lines they will hear from me is that your comfort is not my main concern. It's part of orientation day one. Like, your comfort is not my main concern, because I want you growing. If you do this internship and you're not growing, then you're wasting your time. So I don't care if you're comfortable. Well, that makes me a little uncomfortable. Oh, good. let's look at that. Let's do more of that. Uh, uh, so some of my staff, I kind of have to coach and encourage, like, hey, let's push people into the uncomfortable zone. Uh, I'm a little bit on the other end. Like, I'm on the other edge. Like, I don't hang on that comfort, uncomfortable zone. Like, that line is, I don't even understand that line. I'm way over here, like, who did I push them off the edge? as they're panicking and hyperventilating in the back room before night strike. 
Uh, it's only happened a couple of times. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so are, we, are we growing? Are we willing to put ourselves out there? That was a complete rabbit trail, though. Uh, so staying hydrated, it's, it's what we are consuming, right? Not just people who are thinking like us, but, but also people who are challenging us. Um, and I think of uh, the story, and, and a few months back, we talked about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and, and drawing water as Jesus interacts with her, even though that was you know, a scandalous episode, too, because Jesus was at a well with a woman all by himself on a Saturday night. Oh. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it was Saturday, actually. Uh, but, but he was there, and he, he asked her to draw water. And they're talking about God and worship and, and you know, where do you have to worship? And, and he tells them, if, if you knew who it was that was asking you to draw water, you would ask me for living water and you would never thirst again. Right? So if we are going to be moldable, then we have to stay hydrated. Are we allowing the things of God to, to infiltrate and permeate us. Um, and, and that looks differently for everyone. There's different stages where maybe music more, maybe reading more, but I'm just going to encourage you, if you want your own redemption story of God continuing to use you, then, then stay moldable and stay hydrated. The other story that popped into my mind, I was thinking of the vine and the branches, right, from John chapter 15, and it, it says, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches, and, and anyone who stays connected with me can grow and, and talks, you know, weeding and, and branches and, and even getting rid of the, the bad ones. But, but with plants, typically the source of hydration and nutrients comes through its roots. Right? So, so not only what are we consuming, are we consuming our hydration, because we could come and spray a plant continuously, but if it had no roots, the drops you know, nutrients and, and, and water from the soil, it would most likely die. There's probably a few weird plants out there that live without all that, but but in general. And so I was thinking, what, what are the things we need to stay connected to? Right? And in Scripture, there, there are, you know, those who cease praying. And I think sometimes that's, yeah, especially in our modern world full of professionals, oh, I'm sick. Let's stop and pray. Let's like put our dependence upon a God. Like, oh no, I'm going to go see my doctor. It's the professional. Oh, my car broke down. Oh God, help me in this. Like, I don't need that because I have a professional mechanic. Um, I need companionship. I don't need that because I have a professional therapist. And and we we begin to like sometimes our dependency, our resilience is on all the, the professionals we can hire. And I'm not saying any of those are bad. <laughs> I've gone to a mechanic. I've gone to a therapy. Uh, I go to a doctor. I just had blood work finally done. So yes, I got my labs done. Lori's been on me. Stay healthy. Have you got your appointment? A little naggy. Um, <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> But I, I appreciate it also. Uh, right? So, so we, we do those things, but are we also staying connected in our dependence upon God? Are we staying connected to each other? There's a passage of Scripture that says, do not give up gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. Right? Are, we, are we staying disciplined to stay connected to each other, to church, um, practices that are meaningful to you? I have a... Uh, former mentor with Youth Dynamics, he was my supervisor for a while, uh, and he still sends me a verse of the day. Right now, you can get different apps to do it all, but I, I haven't signed up for any of the apps because I also want to stay connected to the Bronco. And so he sends me a verse of the day, and sometimes I'll interact, sometimes I just read it. But even in just my, my desire to stay connected, I just, and it, that's simple, right? I mean, a verse usually takes less than 30 seconds to read that comes through. And so my practice of trying to, like, again, staying grounded, staying connected, I try to, when it pops up, I see it. I try to stop what I'm doing because I could easily read on the run. I try to stop what I'm doing. I take a deep breath. Exhale. And I always try to exhale longer than I inhale. Not, like, too much longer, but 
In for three, out for four, and I'm good. And then I read the verse. And then I take two more breaths. As I reflect on it, just trying to slow down and stay connected. Right? Um, and I'm not saying everyone has to do that. That's just something that works for me. Right? But what are, if we're going to be moldable, if we're going to be redeemable, what are you consuming? And what are you connected to? Uh, Jeremiah 2.13, it says this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. It's the imagery that the people basically saying they, they, they quit that dependence and relying on God and decided to fashion their own things. Hey, let's, you know, if we, we have our professional citron builders, and that's basically a small well, um, uh, then, and, and we get those, and we get them full of water, then we don't actually have to rely on God for water anymore because we, we did our own thing. Look at how creative we are. Look how resilient we are. And it talks about them being cracked and beginning to leak water. Are we staying dependent on God? Are we staying moldable by God? Because I still have this belief, and you all have heard me say this, like, I don't believe that God has done with you yet. There are more beautiful things He desires you to see. There's more relationships that want to be restored and mended encouragement to others to be spoken into, but also there's works to be done. People need your encouragement. They need your prayers. They need your guidance. They need your generosity. They need your service. Sometimes I even hear like, well, I just, I'm going to stop going to church because I don't get anything out of it. Well, maybe you need to go to church that day and get nothing. But, but maybe you have something that somebody else needs that day. Maybe just maybe going to church ain't about you. Can they say anything? I can say anything. It's, it's in the dictionary now. Um, right? And sometimes we just get so centered. Oh, well, it's my music. Is it my style? Is it my rhythm? Is it, you know, the pastor dresses funny or, or like whatever. And, and yes, there are times when we need it. Yes. But also what I hear constantly, even, you know, Thursday night, serving at night strike. We go and we serve. And for the people who go and serve, 90% of the time they walk away going like, I got so much out of that. And it wasn't even about them. They went to give up their time, give up their generosity, give up their resources. They went to serve. And it wasn't about them. But somehow... It's not a wasted experience because there's a redemptive work going on in their hearts and minds as they've interacted with people. Are we going to stay moldable? Are we going to stay consuming that living water? Are we going to stay connected to that living water? Are we going to stay moldable? Right? Are you willing to have your life be a beautiful mess as clay slime? is all over your dining room table because you're committed, you're willing to be moldable and usable. I hope so because I still believe that there's a God at work. I believe that for the most part, it's not religious institutions like a church building that transform people. It's people living out their faith, living out their beliefs, coming alongside others that transform people. People bring healing. This building can't bring healing. It can be a center for that. It can be a, a missional outpost, if you will. But this building won't bring healing and redemption. The people living out their lives within it is where the work is done. So are you willing to surrender, to be moldable, 
just to see what God might still create out of you? Or are we going to be committed to being right, dig our heels in on issues, defend maybe things we've done in the past? And I just think God's beautiful, redemptive story, what he's continuing to do in me, I thank God that my brain and my theology is not the same as the 21-year-old version of me. Uh, that guy, full of passion <laughs> at 21, but uh, pretty errant, uh, even in how he treated people. And staying moldable, what might God have for you next? I want to read, uh, before we sing the next song, uh, I want to read a prayer that was written. I'm glad I remembered this. Uh, it's called A Prayer to the Potter, and it's based off Jeremiah and then Isaiah. It says, Dear Potter, the lump of clay that I am keeps crying for some form. Day by day, I yearn for you to mold me. This is a trust song, Lord. I am in your hands like clay. I am ready to be transformed. I expect to be molded. I expect to be beautiful. I expect to be loved. And if by chance someone should draw me, as your apprentices sometimes do, I expect to hurt. I'm just trying to say I have surrendered to your dream for me. I am in your hands like clay.
Do you believe what God says of you? Do you believe that you've been redeemed and chosen for a purpose? Um, the first song, some of you may not be familiar with, um, Redeemed, I love the idea of shaking off every chain. Right? Because so often, I just think we carry burdens that limit us. Um, the song is uh, by an artist named Big Daddy Weave. Uh, you can find it if you want to look at uh, the lyrics and songs, but it, it is a powerful one uh, to reflect on. Do we believe the things God says of us? Do we believe he set us free? Do we believe he has the power to continually transform us? Not just that, oh, he did a great work in my life at one time, but that he has an ability to continuously work in us. Um, I think it's significant. Before we uh, get into our closing, I do want to make sure we take time for our joys and concerns and things we ought to be praying for as a church. Uh, so if anybody has a prayer request they would like to share. I have a prayer request for Bill Saltzman. He tested positive for COVID and was moved from his memory care to a COVID memory care. And just for comfort for him, he's doing well, but just it's a big change to go from somewhere where you know him and you don't really know why you're being moved. Yeah. Uh, the people in Ukraine who are facing war and destruction and the cycle of war. So Ukraine, the war and destruction. I didn't even hear anything on the news this morning. Is there another? Not yet. <laughs> All right. So Bill Saltzman uh, has been tested positive for COVID and shifting where he's being stayed and he's already in memory care. So shifting when you have memory issues can be a challenge and then praying for the people in the Ukraine. I feel like it's a country that's been under constant war and turmoil for a while. Other prayers and concerns. I want to continue to pray for the couple um, who've been houseless and living alongside the uh, um, community garden they have. Uh, move. They aren't there anymore. Uh, you know, I don't know stories or how. My hope is they got into a program in transitional housing and they're getting resources, but um, we don't know. So continue to pray for Stephen and his girlfriend as they just uh, find their way in this world. Any other prayers or concerns before we pray? Lori? My friend here has COVID. So Kim, who's been tested positive for COVID, teacher in special ed, and new friend Jeremy, who's fighting addiction. Um, and my uh, spiritual director, uh, John Lemon, is also positive for COVID this week. So um, pray for him and his family. And it also means I don't get to hang out with him this week, which is horrible, right? That connection that we all need is important. Let's pray. Father God, you are uh, an amazing, all-powerful God, and there's not a single need that has been brought up to you that you cannot change. In the scripture text we read, talked about your judgment coming on a nation, but if they turn to you, can you not change the situation? And so, Lord, we ask that you would do great work in our lives and the lives of the people we care about to change circumstances. Lord, COVID is continuing to wreak havoc on people's health. Um, it's wreaking havoc on our ability to connect with one another, uh, the human and emotional needs, but the, the lives, the, the caretakers, the um, people in the hospitals and, and medical professionals and, and even just family caregivers in that situation trying to isolate within homes. The challenge that it brings is just devastating. And so 
we do want to pray for Kim and Bill and John specifically, but, but everybody else who is impacted by this devastating thing that is just, it's not just about our health, it's about our systems, our economy, our way of life, our ability to connect as human beings to one another. Or we pray for what's going on in the Ukraine and um, to live in an ongoing war zone and the trauma, the fear that brings. But I pray that you would be God of peace that would sweep through the land, bring understanding and compassion. There would be restitutions to wrongs that people could somehow figure out without having to point violence downrange. But we pray for Jeremy, too, who um, is dealing with addiction, as well as uh, our, our houseless couple who has moved on. And just the challenges that they face, the battle that so many fight courageously to addiction, and so many also lose to it. I just pray that you work in Jeremy's life. I pray that you would get him connected um, to an advocate, that you would uh, put people in his path to encourage him that he is worth the effort, worth the work uh, that needs to be done to transform and to redeem that situation in his life. I pray all of these things as a God of wonder. Lord, we want to stand in awe of you. I pray this in your name. Amen. Would you all stand for the reading of our benediction? Um, and then when we get done with the benediction, I've actually asked um, Susan to sing us out today as opposed to her just playing a post mood, but we would join together in the um, chorus of Awesome God as that is what we are hoping for. One, it is a declaration. God is an awesome God. But I think right now, where we are as a world, it's our plea. God, be awesome in this place. So, let us read. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things are great, and all things can be made. Now the time is the same thing, but with intention. So go, love intention, extract.